Hi, I'm Tom Long. Today I'm coming to you from the east end of our island. I have some thoughts I'd like to share on the readings for the eighth Sunday after Pentecost. First, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever thought about running away? Maybe your job just became too overwhelming or your family and friends became such a source of pain for you that you fantasized about chucking it all, jumping in your car, and heading for parts unknown? One person I know of reached that exact point in his life. When his brother had been desperate, he used that opportunity to trade his brother's future inheritance of their father's holdings for what his brother urgently needed that day. Later, he conned his father into also passing down to him control of all the family's businesses and family operations. When his brother found out about this, he made it known that once their father passed away, he had every intention of seeking vengeance by murdering him. So, in hopes of saving his neck, this fellow decided that it was time to leave town. On his first night as a fugitive from the family drama, after the sun had set, Jacob looked around and found a rock to prop his head up and laid down to think about all the events that had led him to be out on this dark night, no doubt missing his mother, who had helped him outwit his brother and his father. But it wasn't until he had fallen asleep that things started to get really weird. Even if you've never considered running away, I'll bet at some point in your life you've had a vivid dream that seemed like it was real. One time I dreamed that Joy had done something mean to me. She hadn't. All she had done that night was fall asleep in innocent bliss. But the dream was so real to me that when I woke up, I actually felt mad at her. It took me a beat to get resynchronized with what was real. Jacob had a dream that also seemed real. In it, he saw a stairway. Was it gilded with gold? Did it glitter with diamonds? Or did it have dark varnished walnut banisters like the banisters I slid down as a kid? It didn't matter. What mattered was who was using the stairs. He saw angels going up and coming down again. Again, it didn't matter what they looked like. Maybe they were cherubim. Maybe they were seraphim. Maybe they were warriors with swords in their scabbards. We don't know. What do we know? At the top of the stairs stood the Lord God Jehovah. And this God, who had made a covenant with Abraham and Sarah, this God, who had made a covenant with Isaac and Rebekah, now reveals to Jacob that he, the fugitive bachelor, will also be a child of covenant promise. God announces, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Now Esau had looked at his brother and seen a grasping, conniving con man who deserved to be put to the sword. And Jacob was on the lamb from facing the consequences of how he had behaved. Anyone looking at Jacob's life to this point might be forgiven for thinking the same thing as Esau. For sure, I wouldn't want a brother like Jacob. So let's you and I grab Esau have a seat by the waters of the Sea of Galilee and hear what Jesus has to say to us. In the Gospel of Matthew, we get an idea of what Jesus might say. He tells a parable about a man who sows wheat, but when the crop begins to come up, the field is also filled with weeds. The man's servants want to pull up the weeds, but they are stopped. The owners tell them that when they pull up the weeds, they'll also pull up the wheat. 
In case the metaphor was unclear, Jesus went on to explain that he was the owner who planted the wheat, the devil was the enemy who planted the weeds, and that no mortal was fit to decide who should be uprooted and who should be left to grow. Only God and his angels have a role in the final judgment. What if Esau had reached Jacob before he escaped and put him to death with his sword? What then would have become of the promises of God, the promises made to Abraham and Sarah, to Isaac and Rebekah? Anyone could see that Jacob was no account, not the kind of person you want for a family member or friend. But as he lay with his head on a rock in the dark of night, a miracle happened. God opened the heavens and gave him a vision with a promise that would ultimately reach fulfillment only in a much later descendant. Matthew began his gospel by saying, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac, the father of Jacob. Maybe you feel like you are a prevision Jacob, a nasty little twerp who doesn't deserve to have God in your life. Well, first of all, you're right. None of us deserve God's grace and love. But the funny thing about God is that he loves you and me anyway. He can't help it. It is literally who God is. The Bible says God is love. One person's idea of a weed just might be God's idea of how to bring his blessings into a world of people, needing his love, his promise, which is our hope. Lord, open our eyes that we might see you looking down on us with love and the offer of hope as children of your promise. With no righteousness of our own, clothed only in the righteousness of Christ, we claim Jesus' promise to us that when our hope at last is fulfilled, we, the righteous, will shine like the sun in the kingdom of our Father. Come on, brother. Come on, sister. We have a ladder to climb. Our Father is waiting at the top of the stairs with a loving smile on his face and arms spread wide waiting to embrace us.